I should be writing season 20, episode 13. Well, I should be writing. I should be working on my Hi there, welcome to I Should Be Writing. This is a podcast for wannabe fiction writers, and I am your host, Mer Lafferty. And I've been doing this show for a very long time, talking about writing and the things that you get in your own way. And sometimes other things get in your way, but usually it's yourself. I've been trying to sharpen my format, I suppose you could say, in this show, which often makes me panic and ignore everything. Which, you know, I need to work on. But uh, last week I talked to Wale Talabi and didn't give any sort of intro at all on the live stream. <laughs> so I'm doing this now, the way I used to do it. Get a little bit of pre-recorded preview and then we'll have the episode and then I'll take us out on the end. As for how I'm doing, I am taking advantage of the hyper-focus I have to get a whole bunch of stuff off my plate so I can get started on novel rewrites. So, Wale Talabi is an engineer, writer, and editor from Nigeria, author of the critically acclaimed Shigidi and the Brass Head of Obalufan, which was named one of the best books of 2023 by the Washington Post. I will also mention, now he needs to update his uh, bio because Shigidi and the Brass Head of Obalufan has been uh, named a finalist for the Nebula Award, so congratulations there. He's hopped around the planet quite a bit, but right now he lives in Australia. He's been the finalist for the Hugo, Nebula, and Locus Awards, the Kane Prize, and he's won the Sidewise Award for Alternate History. And what we're talking about now is Convergence Problems, his newest book, which came out last week from Daw Books. So let's get to that interview. <music> Wally Talabi, how, welcome back to I Should Be Writing. I'm very glad to have you. Thank you. I am very glad to be back um, and to be talking with you again. Yeah, it's um, you're you're. We had you on last year with uh, Shigidi and the Brass Head of Obalufan, which is now a finalist for the Nebula Award. Congratulations! Yes. That's amazing. Yes, it is. And Thank you very much. It just is amazing. in case that wasn't enough, you're also up for the novella for the Nebula. Um, remind Novelette. me the name of that one. Uh, Saturday's Song. Saturday's Song, right. Up, up for Best Novelette, um, best which novelette, was published in Lightspeed. Me. Oh, okay. So it's available to read online. Awesome. That's great. Congratulations. You're just on fire. I, I think so. Um, <laughs> and I am... Mildly surprised, but grateful. Um, yeah, I'm just, you know, you keep writing and you never know how things will go and if people will respond or, you know, there'll just be a big yawning silence. But so far, responses in the last, you know, three, four years to my writing have been positive and uh, I, I hope to keep it going. I just keep trying to write interesting things. Yeah, that's that's a challenge. I mean, um I was I was talking with a friend today about how we don't always talk about the the part of your writer's life where things start to go well but not everything goes well and so you're like wait am I am I have I arrived but not cuz I'm still getting rejected and just all the little different places that we all feel at any one time um how, how do you where do you feel like you're on that spectrum and did the you you've been nominated for a lot of awards though i have um and i have only won one ah. um which was the sidewise award for alternate history which was a tie um with oh, wow. Eric Choi. so that was fun because i got to share the award with some mm -hmm. um which is not something you get to do all the time i i think i think you're right in the sense that a writer's career is very much full of constant 
ups and downs, and sometimes at the same time. So we're kind of like Schrodinger's writers, right? You're both successful and not successful yeah. at the same time, um, always, because stuff is getting rejected by sometimes agents or publishing houses, or they want revisions, or they just don't think this works. And at the same time, something you wrote maybe a year or two ago is getting lots of awards buzz, or people are telling you how much it meant to them, or you know it's just responding well with readers or selling a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're constantly in that state of like, am I doing well or am I not doing well? And the answer is usually both at the same time. Yeah. And I think for me, I've kind of I've kind of accepted that that's just the way it's going to be indefinitely. So I don't expect it to change. And what I've tried to do mentally is to convince myself of two things. One is that. I would keep writing no matter what happens because at the end of the day, the reason I started writing was because I like stories. Mm -hmm. So everything else happening externally, which is very easy to get caught up in, but I've kind of tried to focus my mind on, no, the key thing here is I write stories based on what is interesting to me. And as long as I keep doing that, I should be able to keep riding this knife's edge of constant success and disappointment. And that's just <laughs> the way the writer's life goes. The highs might be very high. The lows might be very low. Um, but I try to focus on, I want to write stories that are interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And the second part of this is I want to keep challenging myself. Um, I want to keep learning. I want to feel like I'm learning and improving in some way because that's my metric for success is do I feel like I'm doing progressively interesting things over time? Am I challenging myself in new ways? Um, because that gives me a really strong sense of internal fulfillment. I am that kind of person that like I I love when I figure something out and mm -hmm. I don't necessarily need anybody else to know that I did. Right. <laughs> um, if I feel like there is a difficult story structure or even in my day job, if I feel like there's a challenging technical problem, if I figure out a way, once I understand like, Oh, this, if I apply this principle, this should work. And I try it on my own and it works. There's this really strong sense of fulfillment. I get that just, it's like a little high. Like mm -hmm. I just get on like, yes, figured it and to me that is a success and as long as I can keep getting that um, I think I'll be happy so I try to focus on that that's excellent um to go back a little bit what you were talking about the 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 weird different um like you work on something but then the emotions of either its success or its publication or so it it affecting somebody happens years later maybe now this is my beautiful segue. I'm very proud of this, that you have released your book of short stories called Convergence Problems. Um, you are, you're, the work you wrote years ago is now hitting a new audience. And so how does, how is that for you that that's coming back? Um, it's, it's fun. I, I would say it's fun and interesting to see new responses to relatively some some relatively older ideas there are new ones right because convergence problems does contain brand new stories there is a brand new novella um that's kind of the central uh, the central story of the collection there's a few new stories as well about three of them there's some that were published up to 10 years ago and some of them were published just last year um including Saturday Song, which is nominated for the Nebula, and that mm -hmm. is reprinted in Convergence Problems. So with regards to the older stories, I think I, I mentioned fun. I very much scraped that sense of like internal progress. And what was most interesting to me about putting together this collection was going back to some of the, the older stories um, from, say, 10 to 12 years ago. I think the oldest is from about 12 years ago. And actually revisiting them and in some cases rewriting them yeah I was entirely gonna because i wanted that. to feel oh i wanted to feel like i i had progressed and in fact one of the new stories i'm calling it a new story but technically it's a rewrite of an older story 
um, in the book. It's called Embers. And Embers was originally published on a blog, uh, a very popular blog in Nigeria called Bella Ninja in, I think, 2012 or 2011. Um, and it was just 2,000 words of short story about a man living in a very rural area in the Niger Delta, which is in the southern part of Nigeria, where there is a lot of oil, and that's where oil was first discovered in the country. And so they've had a lot of history of political trauma and environmental damage and all sorts of things going on. And the story was about this person who was dreaming to join the oil industry because they're they are also a large employer of people from that area. Mm -hmm. And this poor boy had thought he had no prospects. Um, and then the oil industry collapses because we go through the energy transition. So I was imagining a future without, um, without hydrocarbons and without um, petroleum. And everybody shifts to this new biological system of making, of producing energy. And he feels a huge sense of loss at opportunity, even though this is the same thing that has been damaging his home and his environment. But to him, he saw it as a way out. Um, and it's kind of about his internal struggle years later to kind of reconcile this and find a way to make his life have meaning again. I wrote that story years ago and I did not have the tools as a writer to tell a story that nuanced or that complex. So it was a very, it was a very plain story, right? I, when I reread it, I was just like, no, 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 no. I, I, I need to rewrite this. So I actually went back and rewrote the story and now it's a novelette. So that's why I'm kind of calling it new because it was 2000 words and now it's about 10. Wow. It's much more expanded, much more detailed, much more, um, could capture a lot more of the interiority and the complexity of emotions of someone like that um, in that situation. And that's one I'm very proud of. So again, it kind of very much, it, 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 the feelings go through me. I feel like I got the chance to improve in some way or to apply new skills to improve something I had done in the past. And that gave me a big sense of satisfaction. So I'm very excited for people to now read this improved version um, of the story. So that's the long answer to your question is I'm very excited for people to see the updated versions of some of these stories. Cause I did make tiny tweaks to all of them. Even the more recent ones, just, you know, in, there's always something to correct. Oh yeah. But with the ones I did a huge, a big rewrite, like embers, I'm, I'm very proud and excited about this. That's great. You've got self-confidence in your own work. Can can you teach me how to do that? <laughs> uh, I don't I don't know. I you know what? I think my wife says that all the time is that I I seem to be very confident. I I've thought about it and cuz you know as writers we love to analyze ourselves because yeah. we analyze our characters to mm -hmm. to know where things come from. I think my origin story is probably my dad. Um, I remember as a child when we would try to, he would help me with my math homework. And whenever I would ask him questions like, oh, could you help me with this? How do I do this? He would never give a straight answer. His answer was always something like, how do you think we should do it? And then he would let me try whatever I wanted. And then he would look through it and he would never correct anything because I was never wrong. He would simply say, do you think this is the best approach? Can you think of anything else? And then he would kind of let me explore and find my own mistakes. And we would keep going like this until eventually he would say, are you sure that you're happy with this solution? If yes, then he would say, perfect. Well done. I was like, but is the answer correct? He's like, it doesn't matter. You have done your best. You should be proud of that. And most of my classmates would always go to the, the answers were always in the back of the book. Mm -hmm. right? So my dad literally tore out those back pages from some of my textbooks so that I would never check the answer because his point was it never matters. It's not about being consistent. It's about being the best version of yourself that you can. So you ask yourself, have you done your best? Could you do better? Can you think of anything else? Once you've explored all those avenues, then you should be happy with what you've done and be proud of it. And this was always the fun part. If you turn out to be wrong, accept the correction, 
learn something new and then try again. Mm -hmm. So I think that is kind of just my inbuilt approach to everything in life at this point. It is, I go through the rigor of thinking, have I done the best I possibly can? If I feel satisfied with it, I'm always my biggest, my own biggest critic. So if I'm satisfied with it, then I just proceed with confidence until someone points out, well, this is pretty terrible. <laughs> and if I go through it and I kind of see, okay, yeah, I see what you mean. Ah, that's something I didn't know or something I didn't think about. Okay, fine. Then it's just another lesson to carry forward to the next thing. Um, but it's not an indictment or it's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean you did something terrible. I, I'm, I'm really grateful to him for taking that approach with me. That's just flat out amazing. I mean, that's that's amazing parenting and teaching all rolled into one. I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, my parents, which was, which, you know, my my teaching from home was, what, you got a 95? What'd your best friend get? 97? Why didn't you get a 97? <laughs> and I'm like, I, yeah. I got an A. Is that not good enough? So it, it was, yeah. yeah. I, I feel like there's too much of that. Like a lot of, I have lots of friends and cousins and everybody. There's so much of parenting that's all about comparing yourself with someone else. Yeah. Right. And I think a lot of us grow up with that, um, with that framework. So we're always constantly comparing, well, how, what's the rating of my book and how's it doing compared to my friend's rating and how many copies did I sell and how does it compare with, you know, the person I went to a workshop with two years ago, how did, mm -hmm. how did they sell? And why is mine not doing great? And metrics and comparisons and checking numbers and stuff, they're useful. I'm an engineer. I appreciate that. But I, I still, I think I retain that core that at the end of the day, the primary driver of my sense of success is, do I feel happy with what I've done? Well, I mean, it's not it's, easy, I will admit. Yeah. And if my ha if my parents did not raise me that way, I am certain I would not have any of these com this confidence. Absolutely not. So, but I think that is where it comes from. Because you know? well, those I mean, are very vivid memories for me. That that's I mean that's beautiful. Honestly, it's it's it and it you know I I hope you don't think I was I was saying anything negative because I'm I admire um, your confidence. It's very well earned. It's just a hard thing for a lot of people to accept. And I mean, even once you start selling, the imposter syndrome kicks in. Is like you can't like this because it came from my head, which means it's not impressive. Which means. I've fooled you and eventually you're going to figure it out. And just all <laughs> these weird hoops we jump through. And, you know, there, there are people who, who this is connected, I swear, who go through a grand scheme of, of like online harassment or, or this, this organized way to ruin someone's life. And you think, couldn't you channel that into anything else, anything constructive? And, and, that's what I, you know, I, I, I know people who've like tried to, to bring down John Scalzi by writing a book like his and one, they didn't. And two, why don't they just write their own book? But it's like, sometimes I think about along the same lines, how we go through these, these times of, of fretting or comparing or looking up the numbers or looking up the metrics and wondering what we need to change. And I think that is wasted energy that could be focused back into writing something. And but you know that does require us to take the emotions out of it. And I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if it's possible. I also I, I also don't think it requires us to take the emotions out of it. I think it's more what you're saying. It's it's a channeling of the emotion in in the right place, and also. Maybe maybe another part of it as well is simply accepting that a lot of the world is complicated beyond our control. Yeah. And there are many other factors that go into perceived success um, that are way, way beyond anything that we are doing. Um, so, for example, at uh, last weekend, which was Easter, I, I was at a friend's house. Um, with a group of people from 
all over the world because that's what happens in Perth. Um, <laughs> it's full of people from everywhere else. But we were having a Easter lunch and we were kind of talking about our childhoods and different things. And this thing came up where people were talking about um, geniuses, right? They were saying there's certain people that are geniuses in their field and what it takes to be one. And they started listing geniuses. And all they were doing was they were listing famous people, right? In tennis, from academia, in movies. They're like, oh, they must be a genius in the field. I mean, no. They're successful. There's a difference between genius and success. Success, genius is potential. It is the ability to do something. Success is the realization of that thing within a particular competitive framework. And the competitive framework has a lot more to do with whether you will be successful than your raw potential or talent or genius, so to speak. Right. Um, So in a capitalist society, thrives on competition and focus on the individual and, you know, accumulation of profit in a sense. Being successful as a person that's very empathetic and always concerned about others, so you don't want to compete too aggressively against them because that in some sense implies damaging them. You will not be successful by a traditional metric, whereas someone who is willing to completely trample on everybody just to climb to the top will be perceived as extremely successful. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with raw ability. So if I, to bring it back to writing, it's the same thing. When you're writing, there is all these things. There's the beauty of the language. There is the the pace of the story. There is the intricacy of plot. There's all these other things that all combine to make a story fascinating. And the completion of the story is success that is associated to your potential or your genius, so to speak, right? And that's a very personal thing. Now, whether the book will be successful is dependent on a million other factors, including who's publishing it. Are they having financial issues at this time? Who's working for them? How's that person feeling? What logistics have they put in place? Um, How much budget have they allocated to marketing? Mm -hmm. Um, Is the marketing person experienced or not? What's happening with readers at the time? Are, is there another famous book coming out that's also covering a similar topic? Um, what's the weather like? Is it going to affect shipping routes and shipping lanes and how much booksellers are going to order based on that time and when it's going to arrive? There's a million things that have zero to do with the book that you wrote. Yeah. So I kind of, I guess as an engineer, I'm very aware of all these things, right? The uncertainties that you deal with when you know, trying to plan or predict any physical phenomena. So you just control what you can control. And that's, again, comes back to what I focus on a lot. And luckily I have, my dad gave me the foundation of confidence to focus on that. And then everything else, you do your best, but you kind of have to accept that at the end of the day, it could go great or it could go terrible. And that has nothing to do with you. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to let go of, but it's something that I think we would all be happier if we could, which is, you know, I, I you think there's there's an anecdote I heard about um, an editor who's who's doesn't have the best track record. So I won't know I won't mention <laughs> them, but they're the story was really interesting, which was the editor was talking to a writer at a convention and the uh, it came to. He said, well, have you sent my magazine any of your stories? And the guy said, well, no, I'm not not good enough to send to your magazine yet. And he's like, you don't get to make that decision. I make that decision. It's your job to write it. And then you send it to me. And then I make the decision. You don't get to make the decision for me. And I think this leads into what a lot of people do when they self-reject, which is, well, this clearly isn't good enough for the top tier. So I'll submit it lower. And um there's no reason not to submit to the best market that you really would love to see it in because it ultimately is not your decision. And, you know, the same goes for award nominations, whether you get it or not. Because I discovered at one point that getting an award nomination and feeling like you don't deserve it is a very weird feeling too. (laughs) But you have to realize that you were not in charge of saying whether you got it or you didn't. So you just have to accept what, once you start putting your stuff out there, you lose a lot of control. 
And that's yeah. that's the way it is. It's it's not it's not a bad thing. It's just something that you got to remember. Yeah. And when when we do remember that, we try to focus back on the on the internal. Yeah. And I say all this stuff, you know, some of it is ingrained from my childhood, but it's something I need to keep reminding myself of, right? Because it does happen. Um, at times, like you said, the imposter syndrome does sneak in when people are like, oh, you wrote the best story of 2023, which is what <laughs> awards, what awards, you know, claim to do. And I'm like, really? I read so many good stories from last year. I'm pretty sure mine wasn't the best. Mm-hmm. So do I really deserve this? And at the end, you just focus back and say, this has very little to do with me. I did my best. I wrote the best story I could. And the rest is up to whatever else is happening. Um, so we just kind of accept wherever it goes. And that's why I keep trying to like focus on personal improvement. Mm-hmm. Um, and as long as I feel a sense of advancing, learning new things, picking up new tricks, which is to tie it back to this collection. It's actually one of the things I'm really proud of in convergence problems. Cause my first collection in complete solutions, I, these are all stories I love, but they are they are mostly told in your traditional formats, right? They are first person or third person points of view. And that's this one story with second person POV. But in terms of experimenting with story structure and story style and, you know, different ways of making meaning of a sequence of events so that you get an interesting story, I really challenged myself to do that a lot with convergence problems. So a lot of the stories here are, there's a lot of structural playfulness. Um, I have a story that's formatted as a blog post with comments at the bottom and Mm. the plot twist takes place in the comment section. Um, I have another story that's formatted as a patent application memo, which with comments as well. And there's a live comment. So it's almost like, you know, when you're online, editing a Google document and you can see someone else is editing it as well. And the story is kind of told in a moment um, as they're making these comments along. I also have another story that's kind of a a retelling of a traditional Yoruba myth. And I juxtapose that myth with a futuristic kind of dystopian story set in the future. Of course, everything is run by climate change, but people live in a domed city. And there's a mirroring, uh, there's a kind of thematic mirroring between the two stories, this old folk tale and this futuristic tale. And I tried to interweave both of them into each other um, so that they there's a bit more thematic heft at the end of the story. And that's something I was doing deliberately. I was trying to, a lot of, with a lot of these stories, they represent me trying to learn new things, learning how to do new things tell stories in different ways to see if they would work. Um, And that's something I'm really proud of as well, because I feel like I learned how to do that a lot more. And it's featuring more and more in my fiction as I go forward now. There's more experimentation. In fact, I think I'll probably have another collection in a few years and it will be full of some wild things. (laughs) But um, I'm looking forward to that already. But I feel like for this collection, I, I, I really leveled up my ability to not just tell a story but to tell it well and in an interesting new way so seeing as how we don't have your dad can you give any concrete advice on like you said you you worked really hard and leveled up when you were writing or rewriting these stories can you give any concrete advice to writers in how to think that way and approach their own writing in a way that they're going to really get something new out of, out of it. Uh, I, I think, so I would probably say it starts from the, the general advice that I think a lot of people get, which is you need to read a lot, right? Because to, to challenge yourself in new ways, by definition, to know what's new, you need to be familiar with what's old Mm -hmm. or what's standard, what's popular, right? Um, So reading a lot gives me, is one of the things that gives me ideas of, I read something this way, and then I wonder, well, what if it was done like that? 
um, or I read someone doing something in a way that I never thought you could tell a story before. And then it makes me think of another way to, to tell a story that's related, but different. So for example, I talked about the, the story I wrote that's formatted as a patent application memo. And one of the inspirations for that, or one of the things that challenged me to do that was actually reading a story by uh, the Zambian author, Namwali Serpil. Namwali Serpil, um, she, she won the Kane Prize for African Writing a while ago. She wrote a wonderful book that was nominated. Actually, no, it won the Arthur C. Clarke um, Prize. But she wrote a story for a small magazine. Um, I forgot their name now. They've stopped publishing. But it was something called Receipts or something like that. And it was just a list of a woman's receipts for expenses throughout her day. And the way she had arranged these receipts, you could actually tell what had happened to her in that day. Oh, that's amazing. And basically it made a story. She made a story just out of listing receipts. And Is that available when I first read it? No, it used to be, and then the magazine publishing it has packed up, so I'm, I don't know where it is now. Um, I'll, I'll look for it. I'll see if, if I can send it to you. Okay, great. Email. And I'm sorry um, I interrupted. No, 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 of course. That's fine. Um, yeah, I don't even remember the title anymore. This was, you know, 2017, 18, maybe, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but just reading that, it, it challenged me in a way. It's like, th this is such a different format for telling a story, but it means I can tell stories in unusual formats too and still get the same emotional result at the end of it. Because that's what stories are, right? They're, they're emotion, emotion engineering. You want the reader to feel something at the mm -hmm. end. Um, and that's what she achieved just by listing expenses through receipts. So when I, at the same time, I was filling out a patent application memo for one of uh, the things I helped co-invent at work, basically something we had built, some proprietary design. And I was filling out that memo. It just occurred to me, it's like, well, what if I could make a story out of this, you know, mm -hmm. this dry, boring document describing a an invention that we think we've come up with. And that that was what drove me in that direction. So reading very concretely can lead to challenging yourself um I've, I've met people that say things they like they read a story and they're like they want to stop writing because they feel they'll never be able to write that well yeah and that, just that as is we, something people experience i've experienced it I, yes. I, i'm not proud but I, it has happened <laughs> and it's a real emotion and that's it goes back to what i said about channeling the emotion in a different way which is you can feel that same feeling like this is amazing Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I can write anything this good, but I'm going to try. Right. Like just adding that little bit at the end to challenge yourself. With, I'm going to try anyway. And it also ties into what you said. You don't make the decision that you're not, you're never going to be able to write anything that good. Yeah. Your, your job is to try. Right. So whenever you read anything challenging, this could be a concrete step. You read something amazing, challenging, take that and say, I want to write something that is as good. That makes me feel as good when I read it, when as, as I did when I read this other person's work. And your objective is not to achieve that. Your objective is to try. The objective is always to attempt it. The trying is the goal. And then the success depends, right, on external factors like we talked about. So that's those are kind of the two concrete steps I would say is just read widely. And whenever you encounter something different or challenging or even just, you know, ordinary, and you think, well, what if I did the the opposite or the inverse of this? Is it possible? Then just convince yourself to try it. Worst case scenario, you will end up with a bunch of half-baked stories that you can later strip for parts into something more complete down the line. But trying is the most important part. Excellent. We're going to take a quick break. We will be back in a moment. All right, it looks like we're back. 
And we did have a message from Space Valkyries. The uh, the trying is the goal is so great as advice, honestly. So, and yeah, the, because that that in that way it's all in your hands, and having control over things like this is is helps us all <laughs> stay sane, I suppose. But um, yeah, you said you wanted to get into the the uh, something else about the intro to your stories. Oh yeah. Um, so one of the things I, I enjoy reading in other people's collections, especially is story notes, right? Sometimes they come just before the story or just after, or sometimes they're all at the back. Um, I know Ted Chang does it. I know Nadia Korofo did it for her collection. I've read a few others, older collections. It's something I, I got into when I was reading collections and I really enjoyed understanding where stories come from. Um, so I also include story notes in all my collections, two of them so far. And of course, Convergence Problems has story notes as well. And one of the things that's, um, that kind of came up as we were talking is that a lot of my story notes include a mention of some other author's work, right? Either a line that I just thought was stunning and I wanted to write something like it from, for example, from uh, Carmen Maria Machado's work. I just read one, the opening to one of her stories gave me, literally gave me chills. And I was like, I want to write an opening line that does something like that. Yeah. Um, so I took inspiration from that. Or even Saturday's Song is a sequel to another story that is well it's, it's the third sequel to a story i first wrote that was triggered somewhere in my subconscious by reading a neil gaiman story that had a really unique idea and i thought that's interesting i wanted to put a nigerian spin on it and then add my own element of the structure of the story um, ask which story that's this um oof, i can't remember the name now i think it's in the story notes um oh, okay. convergence problems yeah can't remember the name right now no i think it's called october in the chair mm. that's the one okay october in the chair um and then yeah lots of or even just reading old um traditional yoruba myths and legends like reminding myself of some of these old folk tales there's elements in those stories that i see that make me think well what if that was in a different context or if I told it using a more modern sensibility. So reading other stories and other people's work drives a lot of my interest. And not even just reading fiction. I, I usually say to other writers, because they always ask, what would you advise younger authors coming in, right? It's the standard question. Mm -hmm. And my standard answer is read a lot. Yeah. And not just in the genre that you're writing in. Read outside like well outside because sometimes the most the most asymmetric ideas are the ones that when you combine them with what you're interested in you get something new right yeah. and the, the same is actually true about i'm going to go off on a slight tangent here please but the same is true of science um the true same is true of sciences the people that actually i've i've, I've checked this the people that actually come up with new and innovative ideas in many of their fields when you check they actually came from a different field. The, the, the chemical engineers that come up with new mechanical engineering theory, um, well, the engineers that come up with new mechanical engineering theory, you check and their background is chemical engineering. Or even in physics, um, the people that, a lot of people that have won the Fields Medal for mathematics did not come from a mathematics background. They came from a physics background. Oh, wow. And they did the math because they needed to. Right. So they were coming at it with a different sensibility um, and so on. Like whenever you check, it's either people with multidisciplinary experience or coming into that field from a different field. And that basically is because they're coming in with a different viewpoint that is slightly off center of wherever the field is at the time. So they see things that other people will not see immediately. They see connections with other fields. They see parallels. They see similarities outside of the center of that knowledge. And so they help to shift the center to a new place. And I think the same is true about writing and our own minds. If you think of your mind as a center, 
of all your experiences, your the things you're familiar with, the things you think work by constantly reading other people's work, especially outside of your own genre, you're constantly shifting the center of your experience and knowledge base. And that will just, by definition, event you will get a lot of new and interesting ideas. And if you take them as a challenge to say, can I do this? Then that now gives you the drive to try something new and interesting. And if you, you know, remember what we said, it's just the trying is the goal you'll keep trying and by definition, you'll keep doing something new and interesting. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, eventually, it will be successful. Yeah, that sounds amazing and very wise. <laughs> I mean, I'm right. You can't well, deny it. I don't know about wise. It's just, just <laughs> observing, observing things. I, I like to observe. Mm -hmm. um, and try to understand where things come from. But I think I think that's all writers. This yeah. is probably one thing writers and engineers have in common. We love to observe and analyze things in different yeah. ways. Engineers use numbers and things like that. And writers use, they observe emotions and interiority. And then we use words to describe. Yeah. yeah. But you, you, you straddle both of those careers. So aside from reading well outside your genre, how does your background speak to your writing life? Um, it speaks a lot. <laughs> so my, I, I kind of have two, this question comes up a lot as well. So I kind of have two standard answers, which I'll give you anyway, but then I'll give you a secret third one. Um, so standard answer number one is that my dad was a chemical engineer who loved fiction and my mom studied English literature. So if you take the average of English literature and chemical engineering, you probably end up with science fiction author. Um, so yeah, I think it's part of it is genetic, mm -hmm. but jokes aside, the, the second standard answer is that I grew up reading both at the same time. And both my mom and my dad were very much, they were very curious about the world. So they had lots of books about everything. And we used to watch lots of documentaries. And then they always did this thing where we would talk about whatever we watched after and like analyze and try to understand. It's like, so what do you think was the turning point during this battle? Was it the technology or was it the military approach? Was it the mentality? Was it external factors? Was it, you know, the weather? So there was a lot of discussion and trying to understand why certain things happened, what was important. And what that did was kind of train my brain to always look at what happened, but also the why. And in a lot of the things we discussed, I guess a lot of it was ancient history, but almost always there was some element of the influence of technology, right? Even things as, I won't say simple, but relatively simple as the expansion of the Zulu empire in Southern Africa was essentially driven by one minor technological change, oh, which wow. is Shaka Zulu just decided that having long spears was inefficient because you couldn't move around easily with them. The spears were longer than you. So it was harder to control them, to swing them around. And so apparently one day in the middle of a battle, he just broke his spear in half and turned it into like a stabbing spear or like a sword. And he was he could move much more freely. He was basically able to... I guess, kill more people, yeah. um, yay. which is not, yeah, yay war, I guess. But <laughs> the point was he re-engineered the traditional Asagai, the traditional Zulu spear, and gave that to all his warriors. And that made them basically almost unstoppable. And he consolidated all these smaller groups and kingdoms in Southern Africa into what became the Zulu Empire and actually defeated the British on several occasions. Um, even though they had far more advanced weaponry. So a lot of this was driven by technology, and I could always see how that factored into a story. So my brain is always, the two are always linked, is how does the technology affect the people? But beyond the people, how does it also affect humanity at a global scale? What does it say about all of us? Right. These are the results of conversations I had with my parents a lot as a child. And I'm constantly thinking of all of them at the same time. 
And then my secret third answer is that I'm just kind of a nerd. I think <laughs> as a result of all this, I I love understanding how things work, coming up with different models for understanding uh, parts of the world, parts of the universe, because that's really what equations are. And I talk about this in the introduction to convergence problems. I think of stories almost the same way I think of mathematical equations is you're building a model for understanding some parts of the world and you need to make some assumptions. You need to make some, put some boundary conditions, which is essentially what you do with speculative fiction. You kind of say, okay, imagine if this was different, that's your foundational assumption. And then you put some boundaries like, okay, I'm only going to explore this time period. I'm only focusing on three characters. All of this is setting boundaries the same way you would do with an equation. And then you explore and you see, well, what does this resolve to? What's the answer? Can I get an answer? Is the equation even solvable? Mm -hmm. um, and how would you do it? And that now comes to structure and point of view and all of those things dictate how you resolve the equation, so to speak. So I am, I am, I think my parents have, they've, they've devised a nerd that really just enjoys seeing the parallels between what feels like the softer side of the world, the things that don't have to do with physics and math and chemistry, but then linking them with those things as well, because they're all one thing at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, the world is, is all connected. Physics is not some separate higher order magic that you cannot, you can only access if you know string theory. It's all around us. It controls everything in the world. And I love the process of trying to figure that out. And I also love exploring the gaps in knowledge, right? Which is where we fill in the supernatural, we put in myths, legends. Um, there's space for all that. Humans have always done that. And I think we always will because we will never completely understand everything, but we will keep trying. And that's one of the things I love about science. Actually, now that I've said that, I think my approach to writing is basically the scientific method. Mm. because yeah see now i'm seeing i'm literally seeing the parallel as we speak um <laughs> because i said the trying is the most important mm -hmm. part and that is kind of the foundational idea behind the scientific method is that we will never know everything we know it's impossible to know everything but we are going to keep trying to generate new observations and keep coming up with a new model to try to explain what is going on around us. So it's not about being correct, right? The aim of science is never to be right. It is to come up with the most consistent explanation for all the observations that you have. And if you get a new observation or you get a more consistent explanation, then you change to that and it becomes a new theory and you're constantly improving. The objective is self-improvement, not correctness. So yeah, maybe that is my writing method. It's a scientific method. Yeah, it works for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it. I like it. See, now I have an idea for like an article. Maybe I should write about that, applying the scientific method to a career in writing or just mm -hmm. as a life philosophy. I'll think about that. Okay. That's fun. Sounds mm -hmm. good. <laughs> maybe there's something there. Maybe there's nothing. Well, you know, you never know until you look at it. Just like exactly testing any theories. Well, I am out of my questions and I don't want to take up any more of your morning. Um, is there anything you want to say to the audience aside from please go buy Convergence Problems because it's amazing? Anything? Please go buy Convergence Problems because yes. it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else do I want to say? I would like to say thank you for listening to me um, because I know you don't have to, but I'm grateful that you did. Um, I would also like to say I am... Um, still on the ballot for the Nebula Awards, That's um, right. as Mur already mentioned, for my novel and my novelette. So if you are a member of the SFWA, um, consider voting. If you read and like the stories, you can also vote for me in the Locus Awards, which I think is still ongoing. I need to check the dates. Yes, I think it is. So you can vote for me there. I would appreciate it. Um, or you know what? Just vote for the stories you love, mm -hmm. you know? Um, Hopefully you love mine, but even if you don't, vote for vote for the stories you love. Yes. And I have a few stories coming out um, later this year, one of which is in an anthology that hasn't been officially announced yet, so I can't say anything. But my most recent story is in um, 
there's an anthology called 99 Fleeting Fantasies, which is edited by Jennifer Brosek. And it's a collection of 99 flash fiction stories. Mine is called How to Win the Gidibo Challenge, um, a practical guide, which is a story that is structured as a list, which is, you know, one of those nice little um, structural story tricks that a few people have used successfully. And I thought, why not? I'll mm-hmm. try that too. Um, and I think it works for this story. So hopefully people can check that out. I did not mention um, that story is actually set in a shared world called the Sautiverse. That's S-A-U-U-T-I-V-E-R-S-E. And the Sautiverse is an Afrocentric shared world that was created by myself and 10 other African authors and authors from the African diaspora. And it's this very cool secondary world, um, science fantasy world that's in a solar system with a binary star and five planets. And we have a whole complicated history and mythology for them. And we are just writing lots of stories set in this world on different planets, exploring it, fleshing out the stories in its history. Um, We published an anthology last year called Mother Sound, the Sautiverse Anthology. And there will be a lot more Sautiverse stories coming out in the coming years because we've written, one of us has written a novel, another one has written a novella, lots of short stories. I wrote a novella set in this world, which will hopefully come out at some point. So yeah, just check out the Sautiverse. We have a website and everything. Um, It's a great little Afrocentric fantasy, science fantasy world to get lost in. And all the stories are connected. So it's fun. That's amazing. Yeah, I remember we talked about that on your last interview. Um, I'm glad that it's going well. I'm excited to check it out. Um, well, yeah. where can we find you online? I'm going to have all these links in the show notes, but to find you, where would we go? You would go to my website, aka my blog, which is W Talabin. That's basically, yeah, W for Wale, Talabi, T A L A B I dot wordpress.com and that's where i usually post about stuff um at least once a month i try otherwise you can find me at a higher frequency on uh, twitter blue sky and instagram which is all the same handle at w talabi uh, yeah oh i'm also on tiktok oh great w talabi as well but I post infrequently there. Yeah, I'm still me figuring too. out TikTok. Yeah, I think we follow each other. Yeah, I'm still I figuring so. it we out. Should, we should. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. The book is Convergence Problems. Um, Wally, we're just delighted to have you back. I'm going to see you in Glasgow <laughs> in person. I'm excited about that. And uh, yeah. good luck at uh, with the nebulas coming up. Thank you. And good luck with the Hugo. Oh, for a skate pod. I hope you you guys win. Thank you. I'm so grateful that Wale took the time to be on the show with me. And I'm looking forward to seeing him in Glasgow at the Worldcon. And I'm hoping to get a lot of recording done. I know I'm going to get one live episode. But I may just run around and do some interviews like I did in the olden days. We'll see. I also have people to meet and a family to hang out with, so we'll see how it all fits together, but I can always hope. If you enjoy I Should Be Writing, please consider giving us a review on your favorite podcatcher. You can also support via Patreon at patreon.com slash mightymur or Substack, substack dot, no wait, that's mightymur.substack.com. My website, and which has links to all of my books, all of my podcasts, and where I'm going to be this year, is at merverse.com. And usually, I stream, I live stream these episodes on Twitch, Tuesday, Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. So I hope to see you at one of those. But I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope I'll see you for the next one, because you should be writing. Thank you for listening to I Should Be Writing, the longest-running writing podcast in existence. This episode was made possible by the Fabulous, who support the podcast via Patreon or Substack. Join the Fabulous at patreon.com slash or mightymer.substack.com. 
Theme music provided by John Anilio. Art provided by Numbers Ninja. And podcast hosting provided by Libsyn. This episode is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 License. You can find all of my books and podcasts at merverse.com. I